Hey, Rob, how are you? I'm very good, mate. Very well, thank you. You? Good. Yeah, really good. I've been having a little bit of a plan about this podcast, and I've decided to call it the very exciting name of the secret phobia. Um, so prepare yourself for that. I'm okay. going to dive into a little bit of why I'm wanting to keep it in that direction. Now, of course, you're probably going to be thinking about the fact that quite a few years ago when you were developing the program, you were going to call it the secret phobia at one point. Um, now, of course, in relation to why you're going to call that the secret phobia, it would be really good to have a bit of a chat about just how unknown a metaphobia tends to be because, you know, everyone to a point has heard of claustrophobia or arachnophobia, right? But quite often, most people haven't heard of a metaphobia, um, especially the therapists, the doctors, and even some of the sufferers themselves. I get messages all the time saying that, oh, it's so nice to see that there are other people like me. I thought I was the only one. I had no idea it had a name until now and these sorts of messages. So why were you going to call it the secret phobia? Do you know, I'm, I'm actually, I sometimes think we should have, I should have done, I should have stuck with that. And I think s several reasons, uh, primarily because there's, there's one of the, one of the um, major causes and influences of emetophobia in a person is social anxiety. Okay, so there's a lot of social anxiety yeah. involvement. Um, and social anxiety quite often goes hand in hand on a set of scales with self-esteem. So generally speaking, the better you feel about yourself, the higher your self-esteem, the lower your social anxiety. So high social anxiety goes hand in hand, most often with low self-esteem. So when you've got someone who has high social anxiety and low self-esteem, and they've got a phobia which they think of as silly or ridiculous or embarrassing or stupid they're obviously mm. much less likely to talk about it you know we've talked before about the fact that as we know most suffer as a female most husbands boyfriend partners girlfriends don't even know that their partner's got it don't even know so uh, a, a, a lady may have had yeah. emetophobia all her life and not only had to suffer with it but has kept it hidden from her husband or partner all of that time due to the social anxiety and due to the sense of self-judgment maybe that goes along with it and the avoidance of talking about it and everything else. So there is another thing which links to that, which is uh, to have a metaphobia, you've got to have a strong desire for control as well. And a desire for control in this context is really about trying to control situations where you would feel emotionally out of control, right? If I don't believe I'd cope with that social event, I've got to try and control it or avoid it instead. So most emetophobes also have a strong desire for control. Now, if I'm suffering really badly with emetophobia and it's ruining my life, but I believe I've got a lid on it, I'm less likely to tell someone about it, right? I don't want you asking me questions about it. Mm, I don't yeah. want you suggesting things. I don't want you pushing me. I don't want you challenging me, Joe. I don't want you saying, come on, Rob, let's go to the park. I don't want to go to the park in case a kid's been ill in the park. But I don't want to have to tell you that because I don't want to talk about that because I don't want that look on your face as if you say, Rob, don't be mad. You know, you can't catch it or you might catch it or why are you so worried? Yeah. So the desire for control means I keep my cards pretty close to my chest. Okay, so you've got desire for control, the want to manage my own emotions and other people's emotions. And then you've got specifically social anxiety, which goes hand in hand with low self-esteem, though most emetophobes don't realise they've got low self-esteem. They might not notice that. So that means I'm, I'm unlikely to tell anyone, I'm unlikely to talk about it. And it's silly, if you think about it, because somewhere around 5% of women have got a metaphobia. That's one in 20, right? That's about one in every class. Yep. That's two or three mm. in your friendship group. You go out tonight with your friends from your rowing club or your hockey club or, Joe, your football club, okay? There'll almost certainly be two other emetophobes there. 
almost mm. every woman knows at least one other woman that they're probably good friends with that suffers from metaphobia. And they almost certainly won't have been told that they do because of desire for control and social anxiety. Now, they may have noticed things. You may have noticed that Sarah is happy to go uh, on a cards night, but not when it's being held at the pub. Or might go yeah. on a Thursday night, but is reluctant to go on a Friday night. And you never mm. know. You think, why does Sarah never go on a Friday night? And of course, Friday night, people are more likely to be drinking. There's more likely to be someone being ill. So they may yeah. have noticed them that there's some behaviours that that kind of don't make sense, particularly around. Mm, they're not going to you know, together. When we go yeah. out, when we go out for a, our uh, WI meeting, when we go out for a girls' night out. Sarah never eats anything. She has a little bit of salad and picks it. Never really eats anything. And I've always thought because it's worried about her weight but actually it's because she's over controlling um her emotions and her exposure to what she believes are things that might make her feel unwell so that's that's the that's the first reason then social anxiety yep. desire for control fear of being judged fear of being scrutinized fear of being made to feel stupid you know if you told if you told someone you know if i told you joe i got a client at the moment that's got a fear of four color pens right your yeah. natural reaction though you didn't because you're being sneaky your natural reaction is to smile a little bit to think crikey that's bonkers why would you have a fear of four color pens right so yeah. someone with a metaphobia yeah. believes that most people would think that they are silly or or, or stupid even to have that phobia so that's a massive thing so you play your cards very tight to your chest and you don't tell anyone and you certainly don't tell your gp mm. okay or if you did you probably wouldn't be honest right which leads me on to the second part of the answer right which is I haven't seen any research on this more recent than about eight years ago but eight years ago there was a study done and it said that something like 68% of doctors and therapists and specialists had never heard of emetophobia. They'd never heard mm. of it. Okay? And that's because primarily they weren't being inundated with patients complaining of it. Because most patients, most people yeah. with emetophobia, as we know, don't know that it's got a name. And also the social anxiety and desire for control means they're not going to go around telling everyone and they're certainly not going to go to their GP saying, I've got a metaphobia, can you help please? Because of social anxiety. Mm. So because doctors have never heard of it, they haven't had to look it up or, or figure out what it is or go into DSM-4 and find out all about it. So that's part of that reason. The other part of the reason why most professionals had never even heard the term is because... If you think if you go to if you go to a therapist, you know as you know as a psychotherapist, if you go to a, a psychotherapist, they're probably not going to ask you for your diagnosis, okay? Um, and and even if they did, most of metaphobes never heard the term of metaphobia, right? So they're not going to go. Yeah, hi, my name's Rob. I got a metaphobia. Can you help me, please? So they're going to say, how can I help you? And then yeah. you're going to say, well, do you know what? I'm really funny around food sometimes and I avoid certain situations in life and I get really anxious about taking the kids to school, going to the park. And they're going to think, well, it's a, it's a generalised anxiety disorder. How does it make me mm. feel? I just, you know, I'm, you know I'm, I'm really stressed by the whole thing. I feel really low about the whole thing. All oh, right, you're depressed. So the diagnosis, based on how you're feeling and based on your, your behaviour is way more likely to be something like depression or depressive episode or anxiety or um, uh, generalised phobias or if there are other comorbid symptoms, which as you know they quite often are with emetophobia, you might just get diagnosed with anorexia or OCD. Yep. Okay. Mm. Or some kind of brooding related disorder like depression, something like that. And then, of course, the standard treatments for those symptoms aren't going to touch emetophobia, which is why 
as you know, yep. most of the people we see have been through, you know, I think the average is 5.6 lots of treatment before they come to us. Okay, they've been for anxiety treatment, they've been for CBT for their depression, they've been to this for their mood disorder or for the fact they can't relax or they've been some stress management. Because they weren't able or didn't want to articulate clearly to the professional what they were suffering from, the professional, in inverted commas, has made their, their diagnoses based on the behaviour and the feelings described by the patient. Okay, And of course, if you've never heard the term emetophobia, you couldn't possibly diagnose it anyway. You know, yeah. how, how many GPs have had to diagnose a fear of a travel mug? Right? Yeah, it's going to be low, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, very, very low. So if I go to my doctor today and I'm talking about my anxieties and, and when I'm in the car and when I have to go to work and when I'm doing a night shift, there's, you know, and the anxiety around it and drinking and blah, 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 there's no way a doctor's going to turn around, ah, you've got, you've got coffee mugophobia because they don't know it exists. Hmm. It's really, really hard because of that. And that then, the knock-on effect is... I remember when I was running my clinic in Cambridge, as far as I could tell, this was a long time ago, I was the only person in the UK at the time, only therapist, that had the word emetophobia on the website. No, nobody else had, uh, nobody else, the, the, you know, I didn't search every website, right? But mine was the only website that came up back in the day for emetophobia. And yep. this was now 30, yeah. 33, 34 years ago. I was, I was the first person that heard of it. And as we talked about before, I'd only heard of it because a girlfriend had it and had, done, and, and had found out the actual yeah. name for it. I don't think it was even in DSM-4 mm. then as specific fear of vomiting. It was just the, mm. the, you know, the standardised, I guess it's Latin name, emetophobia. So it's a massive yeah. issue even today, as you and I know. You get it on social media. I get it directly coming into him. Oh my God, it's so amazing. I found out what this called. It's like, right, is it, you know, it should, it should be much better known now. It, it should be easy to, to find. Yeah. Um, mm. And that holds people back. And of course, the moment they know, I missed the point. Because you feel sometimes so embarrassed and or stupid for having this phobia, you assume you're the only person in the world that's got it. I've never, yes. none of my friends yeah, have got it. I've never met anyone who's got coffee mm. mugophobia, right? So I feel a right idiot, Joe. Yep. Right? I'm not going to tell you I've got yep. coffee mugophobia. I'm not going to talk about it at the mm. rugby club tonight. I'm not going to talk about it when I'm going in school today in the, in the, in the teacher's you know, room lunch break say hi oh, anyone else got coffee bugophobia because they're going to look at me as I'm a complete idiot so I'm not going to tell a soul and I don't tell a soul mm. nobody else tells a soul there might be five other people in that room with coffee mugophobia but because we're all anxious and feel on the spot and embarrassed about having it no one talks about it so the moment people do realize there there's a name for it and there's a website for it and there's other people out there with it the outpouring of kind of thank god there's other people out there and that's when we get those emails and the relief that there's someone else that is so significant because of all those things i just talked about yeah yeah it, it, exactly and you know just bringing it back to me because it's all about me isn't it you it's don't have the metaphobia i used to have it it's all about me um who did you is, tell well, this is the thing, right, is the narrative of what you've just spieled out there is word for word, pretty much how it went for me. I mean, when I first started really struggling, with excuse my me, sorry, I'm butting about... in joke, joke, joke. Go on. Sorry, I'm Go butting on. in before you say it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make a prediction. OK, mm. we know that boys have less anxiety than girls, less social anxiety than girls, because we're under entirely different pressures than girls are, particularly mm -hmm. around it, uh, um, bodily functions okay? okay so you are you are more likely to have told someone uh, uh, we'll have to dig out some research if it's been done i'm going to guess mm. i'm going to hypothesize that men and boys are 
more likely to tell people than girls would do. Still not everyone, still not many, you're not going to blab about it at a party. So you are more likely to have told your mum and your closest friend. Yes, right on one part, wrong on the other one. Um, and just for everyone listening in, me and Rob have never actually discussed this, so he is trying to hypothesise so I don't contradict everything that he's just said, right? Um, but I told, other than my mum and my dad, because I had no choice, because they were seeing everything, not a soul, not a soul, okay? Um, when I first realised that I hated vomit, I was about 10 or 11 years old, and I went through the general systems in the UK here for anyone that's listening overseas we have CAMS which is a NHS uh, sort of young person's intervention system to help them with emotional recovery and all of these sorts of things um, and I initially went through them not once was the term metaphobia mentioned uh, they were trying to put it down to general school avoidance um, they tried to tell me that potentially I was autistic they tried to point in all different areas but never a metaphobia, no matter how much I tried to relate to the fact that I just didn't want to go in because I was terrified of seeing someone being sick at school or anywhere, right? Um, and then saw... Did you tell them that, though, Jim? The therapist. Did you say yes, yeah. Oh, say, ooh, there we are. Okay, yeah, cool. The right, reason I don't want to go in yeah, is because point. I don't want to see yeah. them sick. Yes. Yeah, I mean, we're talking... Oh, 12, 13, 14 years ago. So it's difficult to remember word for word. I, I, I can't say for certain, you know, I can't say for certain whether or not I, I said it outright. No, I must have done because after a while, after a few years, they got on to trying to do exposure therapy and showing me pictures of people being sick. So yeah, I must have done, right? Um, which as you say, is definitely not gonna be the case for everyone. So, but even then into my sort of young adult life and my first proper relationship when I was about 18 years old, even then I didn't tell my girlfriend what I had. I'd said that I had anxiety. I would always tell everyone that I had anxiety. Why not? Right, because I didn't want to say emetophobia. Why? Because, you know, that, that, that would allow me to avoid things and disappear a bit early and act in a bit of a slightly different way and because I had anxiety and everyone understands anxiety and everyone's going to feel sorry for you if you have anxiety. But in my head, it's, well, if I say that it's all around vomit, well, then people are going to think I'm weird. So no way, I'm not going to say that. Not even to my, you know, not even to my girlfriend at the time, I didn't want to say that it was about vomit. I just said, oh yeah, I couldn't get on that plane on holiday because I suffer so badly with anxiety. Not the fact that I couldn't get on that plane because I was terrified that I was going to be sick on the plane. Sure. I didn't say that. I said I couldn't get on the plane because of anxiety. Butting in again. Okay. Yeah. I love this, right? Mm. I'm asking you the questions today. That's great. It's a different feeling for me. Yeah, yeah, okay? yeah. Okay. Is there, and this yeah. is a weird one, and I've actually genuinely never thought about this before. Is there mm -hmm. being a boy with a metaphobia and not telling your friends? Is there mm. an element in that? I reckon there might be a bigger element of control in that. Were you ever worried that if you did tell your mates, they might try and make you be sick or they might keep going in front of you and things. Whereas girls are less mm. likely to do yeah, that. Yeah, 100%. Okay. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, and given the sort of type of my friends, like a lot of, a lot of rugby boys and a lot of the sort of lads that really couldn't give a hoot when it comes to being sick and like to take the mick and all of that, right? there was a big part of, oh, well, you know, they're going to purposefully stick the things down the throat or they're purposely going to, you yeah. know, do all of these things or send in front videos of, you. of people being sick or, you know. Yeah, yeah you know, all that. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. So it's way easier to say that, that it's just about anxiety. But that's still just, I would say, a part of it and not the whole picture because, again, I knew in that relationship I was in that, you know, I knew that my girlfriend would have been sympathetic about it but even so, there was still such a big part of me that was embarrassed to say that the amount of suffering that I was going through was just down to vomit. Because in my eyes, I saw that as something that was a bit weird and a bit strange, which of course it's not. But to me, having no idea what was really happening to me, it was. It felt weird. So if why, you, why can I be going through as much as I am? If you had a phobia of getting stuck in a lift or injections... 
Mm -hmm. Would mm -hmm. you have told that to your girlfriend? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, but not a fear of being sick. What's the difference? No. Yeah, because you know, if I had claustrophobia, arachnophobia, even I don't know. I think I. It's it's very easy to say for sure with my friends because it is that you know the fear of them potentially exposing me to it. It's that desire for control that you were talking about earlier. In relation to the girlfriend, I think the fear of her thinking that I was weird and just wanting to end the relationship with me because of that, I think. Because it was perceived yeah. as weird. Um, yeah, yeah, just because I perceived it as a, a strange phobia to have. What if, yeah. what if you had a phobia of driving over the speed limit? Would you tell your mates that? Not you driving, personally. You being a passenger in a car that was driving fast. You had a phobia of being a passenger in a car that was driving fast. Would you tell them that? No, I don't think so. Because I think I would then be afraid that they were going to then start going over the speed limit. Yeah. You, uh, they're more yeah. likely to try and do it just to upset you. Just have a laugh. Yes. Not not yeah. knowing. Yeah, absolutely. Not, yeah. not understanding how horrible it would be for you. That's what boys do. Right? Mm. That's what boys are like. Yeah. If you tell him yeah. you got a phobia yeah. of spiders, yeah. you probably wouldn't yeah. tell him you've had a phobia of spiders, would you? No, pro no, again, yeah, probably not, right? Because as soon as you do, then it, it's not coming from an unkind place. It's just a bit of fun, right? Because um, you get, you can't, as, as a, in that kind of situation, it's really hard, especially if you're not that empathetic, to really understand and put yourself in that person's shoes and think just how much turmoil you could put them through by going and doing that regardless. It's just, well, I haven't got it. How could they possibly be that yeah. afraid of being sick? Or how could they possibly be that afraid of a spider? You know, they're going to panic a bit and that's going to be funny. Oh, yeah, I'll just do that. But that's interesting yeah. because that's, that's not a social anxiety thing. That's just desire for control. Mm. The fear of exposure. It is. The yeah. fear that I'm not going to tell anyone mm. because they might put me in the situation. You, you're, not, you're not socially anxious. Mm. You're not worried about being judged for it. You're not worried about them thinking you're an yep. idiot. You're just worried that yep. some little turd is going to go and pick up a spider, stick it in the back of your neck. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and just on top of that, going back to what you were saying at the beginning, because I was quite a high functioning emetophobia sufferer. I still went to music festivals. I did, still did a lot of things. I mean, there was heaps that I avoided. But I think because I was functioning at a relatively high quality of life, even with emetophobia, I didn't feel like I needed to really express it as well or you know given the circumstances of things i was going to say going on to a music festival going back to that desire for control and putting myself in a position to be exposed to it it would be very easy in my mind to think oh well if i tell you know if this person knows that i have a metaphobia and they're all drunk right now you know they could so easily make sure that when they do go and be sick at the end of the evening before they go to sleep that they'll purposefully do yeah. it in front uh, of joe them, come right? over here so come over here i've got something to show you yeah. yeah. Joe, just on yeah, that, yeah. just on that, yeah, just exactly. on that note, I'm hypothe hypothesizing again. Mm. I'm hypothesizing again based yep. on the fact that boys tend to have less social anxiety than girls do. When you say you were mm -hmm. high functioning, I think what you mean is you didn't limit social situations as much as most people did. You still had a good social life despite emetophobia. Yes. Is that fair? Yes, yes, because I, yes, yeah, yeah, I, I didn't, outside of social situations, you know, I would never get on a plane, I would never do lots of things that emetophobes wouldn't do, but in relation to social situations, yes, I could do it all, go to parties, go out, do all of these things, yeah, yeah. Mm, so, and that's probably because the social anxiety was less. Can you give us 10 things that you would avoid? Yeah. 10 things you would have avoided. Flying on a plane, what else? Yes. Okay, so flying on a plane. Um, taxi, back with anyone that was drunk. Um, oh my God, I'm really having to bring myself back into this. 
It's been a while, listeners, it's been a while. Um, what about the hand washing of, stuff, lot of trans- food avoidance? No, no hand washing. Food avoidance, um, yes, I always had to be the one, either myself or my mum cooking. If I was going out to eat in a restaurant, it was always vegetarian food um, or always someone with five five star food rating, health and safety. Um, so you check their food rate. You, you'd Google the restaurant before you went and check them out. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. If it, if it was four stars or below, not a chance, no way. Um, I would, you know, never dream of going to somewhere that didn't have five stars. Um, and for clarity, Joe, I mean, there's going to be a million. Joe, for clarity, yeah. for anyone mm-hmm. that's listening, explain that, would you? Why, why would you only go for five stars? Okay. Sure, yeah. I mean, I imagine most of the emetophobes that are listening would get that straight away. But if you're listening and you're not, it's purely based out of the fact of, well, if it's not five stars, then there's a chance that the kitchen and the way that they handle food won't be perfect and up to scratch. And they could potentially, you know, grab the chicken and then not wash their hands properly and start making my salad, right? Or whatever it is. And then that would boost the chances of me Getting sick, being sick. Okay. Okay. You still only thought three, Joe. And there's yeah. people listening now thinking, do you know what? His <laughs> emetophobia wasn't that bad at all. I don't know what. I don't know why he's no, on this no, podcast. No, no, got it. You need to explain yourself, mate. Because yeah. <laughs> I remember it being um, really, really bad. Mm, it was. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It was. Um, yeah. No, I was the worst emetophobe possible. Not a chance that anyone was worse than me. Um, what else did I do? Uh, I mean, school, not going into school. I missed two whole years of my academic life what? because I couldn't face being in a classroom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You missed two years The entirety years of, of year seven and eight. I, yeah. Yeah. Didn't go in. Not once. Um, or if I did, it was very briefly to sit outside the, uh, the head teacher's office, but it would be a complete palava a full-on meltdown about it and then i would leave early and that was that and i'm guessing yeah. again that was more about controlling your exposure than it was social anxiety you weren't avoiding because yeah. you're worried oh, massively so. okay no. that's still no. Only... yeah no I, it was it was Five. purely out of... <laughs> um okay. Dad, miss, missing two think, years joe? of school uh, that joe that's a big thing yeah, yeah, no, no, a massive thing, um, especially the first two years of secondary school, and it had a massive knock-on effect, especially on my social skills um, coming off the back of that. Um, what else would I do? I would always do little things in relation to food, like ensure that I was always checking the sell-by dates, making sure that if there was a little bit of milk at the bottom of the carton, I would never drink that. I'd have to open up the fresh one. Um, I would never heavily exert myself in exercise. If I started to feel myself getting too out of breath or my heart rate was too high, then I would stop straight away. Um, I would never, never have sleepovers, share a bed with anyone for a really long time because if I woke up feeling sick, um, I wanted, and again, this wasn't for the social aspect, right? It was because in my head, I felt like, Every time I started to feel nauseous, I would need to be on my own straight away because that's how I felt more in control. As soon as there were other, you know, I had to go out for a walk, right? I had to just be away and on my own because that meant that I was able to think clearer and process my... It wasn't so much about worrying about having, you know, my my mum next to me, right? It was... I just felt more in control of There's my less own. to worry about. Um, yeah, yes, yeah. Um, you know, if, if I wanted to walk off, I could walk off, right? Final question, apologies. So what you mentioned yep. a minute ago, when you mm-hmm. did first get in a relationship, you might, that must have been fraught yep. for you the first time you did that. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I can, I can remember multiple instances of times where... Um, I left at one particular night. I, I was feeling really nauseous. We'd eaten some Chinese and I think I'd just started to really obsess over the amount of food that I'd eaten to the point where she was asleep next to me and I just 
got up and drove home, didn't wake her up, didn't say anything, didn't apologize that I was just disappearing in the middle of the night. I just left and I got home and I sent her a message that morning saying that I had a bit of a panic attack. I hadn't mentioned anything to do with the fact that it was just because I was feeling really nauseous. I just had a bit of a panic attack. I wanted to deal with it on my own. I'm so sorry for leaving. You know, that was, that was all it was. Um, and yeah, a million and one other things along with that. And probably ultimately the reason that, I, in fact, absolutely the reason why that relationship came to an end was because of my desire for control. I'm Definitely. sorry, I meant more getting into a relationship. The, the idea that mm. I'm going to ask that person out on a date. I'm, gonna, I'm going on a date yep. the first time with this person. Now that's always anxious yep. and yep. anxiety provoking for anyone, right? Mm. That must oh, be there's been... another element with metaphobia. Yeah. Yeah. All, all, all the days is what, what if I go on it and I'm sitting there and I start to feel nauseous? You know, what, what if I start feeling nauseous on this date? Right. It's not so much. I mean, anyone worries about the quality of the conversation, but it's, you know, there's a, there's a lot more ties to that than just the, the first day nerves. There's so many emetophobia add ons to it. Wow. Well, there you go. That I think we've I think we've done that topic well. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, yeah, I don't think I have have much more to add on my part. No, I think we've done it. I, in my notes, um, there's a part of me that, that, as I said earlier, does still wish I, I I'd have called it that. Um, Hmm. Because, it's a, because it is still I mean even with the advent of the internet right now I know, you, I know you've never known a life without the internet right but people my age we hmm. didn't have the internet I remember getting email for the first time how old was I I would have been 20 6 or 7 maybe so you know 25 years ago how old are you now yep how old are you 24 Right, so you know e you've had email since you were born. So even with the internet and the yes. ability to search, so why aren't every one of the twelve million English-speaking emetophobes searching for on Google every day? I've got a fear of being sick. What's this called? Because then they would all know, mm, and yeah. then Doctor Google yep. would know, and then all the GPs and all the therapists would know. I know, I know, it is much more. Mm. It is much better known now. But you and I both know every week we get emails. So are they not even mm. searching for what's this called? Yeah, yeah. It's just to add on to that, because obviously I do a lot of social media stuff. When I'm looking at hashtags, when you put in a, when you put in a hashtag at the bottom of a post, it comes up with how many other people have put that exact hashtag. So it will say like, you know, 2 million, 2.4 million, blah, 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 right? If you put in a hashtag of sick phobia, it only comes up with about 300 plus other times people have used that hashtag. And probably the majority of them are other Thrive coaches mm. that have hashtagged that in there, right? So no one's really searching because a lot of people on social media, they search for the hashtags. Yeah. No one really searches sick phobia. Um, even the metaphobia is down at a few thousand. Yeah. Um, it's still not that high in relation to the millions and millions of people that suffer from it. Hopefully, this podcast talking about this will go some way then to, uh, particularly if some of our listeners, viewers will share this. Let's make sure we properly mm. call it a metaphobia, the secret phobia, because people might share it a bit more yeah. and um, might let other people mm. know a little bit more about it. Yeah, yeah, because as, as, as we say, it is part and parcel of why we've done this podcast, because it is, it's the secret phobia, um, and that just makes it significantly more difficult to get people the treatment that they deserve and need to get over it for good. Yeah. Brilliant, Joe. Thank you very, very much. Cool.